Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event with author Rolf Peterson, presented by University of Michigan Press. We'll be watching for audience questions throughout the event. If you're on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of the screen. If you're on Facebook, please let us know your question in a comment. You can turn captions on or off using the live transcript button in Zoom at the bottom right side of the screen. We'll be recording the event this evening and sharing it on our Facebook page later this week. Tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Rolf Peterson. Rolf is an internationally recognized wildlife ecologist. He's best known for the, his leading role in research on Isle Royale's wolf and moose populations, ongoing for nearly 50 years now. It's the longest running and most widely cited study of predator-prey dynamics in the world. An emeritus professor at Michigan Tech University School of Forest Resources and Environmental Science, Rolf and his students have conducted wolf studies in Alaska, Yellowstone, Minnesota, and mainland Michigan, though Isle Royale continues to be his primary focus. Tonight, we'll discuss Rolf's book, The Wolves of Isle Royale. The book recounts Rolf's on-the-ground work studying the balance that has developed on the remote island in little more than a century between one of Amer North America's most mysterious and misunderstood apex predators, the gray wolf, and its key prey animal, the moose. Illustrated with hundreds of color images, the book offers readers a vivid look into Rolf's time with the wolves and the memorable incidents that, in his own words, left him humored, perplexed, gratified, or in wonder. Rolf, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Thanks very much, Scott. And I guess you can see the title slide there, okay? Yes, we can. Okay, <clears throat> I'll start in and I'll uh, take about a half an hour to uh, hit some hi highlights of the last few years and uh, where we think we are right now in terms of wolves and moose on Isle Royale. Um, I should start though by pointing out uh, my co-authors, John Bustich and Sarah Hoy, uh, they're really doing the heavy lifting uh, for the project and uh, I do the fun stuff <laughs> and try to keep the field operation rolling. Uh, I should also point out the, the uh, uh, main financial uh, sources of financial help for this work come from National Science Foundation and the National Park Service. Uh, and then about a third really come from private donations. And then of course, Michigan Tech has provided an academic home uh, since the mid 1970s for this long-term work. Uh, this is a, a slide to remind me not to forget the big picture. <clears throat> how did we ever, how did we get into this situation of, of, a, of a protected wolf population uh, declining to virtually extinction? And it's a, ultimately a climate change story. Um, as CO2 in the atmosphere has gone up, the frequency of ice bridges on Lake Superior connecting Isle Royale to mainland of Ontario and Minnesota has gone down. So where we used to have good ice bridges eight out of 10 years, now it's uh, more like one in five. Or, uh, and then when they do form, they're usually very brief. Wind is a major problem. Uh, to maintain an ice bridge, it really requires cold temperatures and calm calm conditions. And Isle uh, Royale's gotten warmer in the winter, the winters are shorter and also windier. Another big picture item is, uh, is wolf conservation throughout the United States. And there's a recent uh, addition, a significant addition to this picture uh, in an article published by Bill Ripple and, and 19 other authors, including John Bustich, in bioscience just a couple couple months ago. And in it, uh, they've, through very careful analysis, they've come up with areas of federal land in the West where it's very reasonable to expect wolves to live. And this will generate a lot of uh, comment and undoubtedly some controversy. Similar projections were made for Upper Michigan uh, 30, 35 years ago, and it was it was unbelievable to think that wolves could live throughout the upper peninsula of Michigan it was just beyond anybody's uh, grasp, and yet it, it happened. So um, we may see a lot more of this type of map in the future. Now getting on to the specifics of Isle Royale, um, the, red, uh, the red line shows wolf 
numbers uh, annually in the winter since 1959, and the green is uh, uh, the great herbivore of the moose. Uh, there have been some huge peaks and, and depressions in both wolves and moose. Um, I'm going to talk about, of course, these last few years here, when wolves uh, declined to virtually extinction, just two animals who weren't reproducing. Uh, the National Park Service, after several years of discussion and formal review and public input, uh, finally in 19 or 2018, uh, approved of uh, an operation to restore wolf predation to Isle Royal. And that was done unbelievably quickly in a uh, space of less than two years, 19 wolves were brought to Isle Royal. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. So the, these last few years are, are of great interest and uh, particularly um, interesting from the standpoint of where do we think it's gonna go from this point. But then I'll also back up and tell a, a story from uh, the early 2000s up through about 2010, uh, when wolves were really uh, uh, in charge, more or less. Uh, whenever the uh, whenever the red line is uh, above the green, uh, wolves are in charge and, and greatly depressing moose density. Um, and during those years, uh, which followed the immigration of one new wolf from the mainland, who uh, renewed the genetics of the population, predation rates rose to a level we'd never seen before. Their uh, wolves were killing as much as 20% of the moose every year. And that produced a moose population that hovered around 500 for many years. And that led to a, a major potential recovery of trees um, which was truncated, unfortunately, when the wolves collapsed, but it also had some effects on aquatic systems. And those are notoriously difficult to figure out. And so I'll, I'll spend some time uh, giving details on uh, one important case study from Isle Royale. So uh, our annual report uh, where, where you can go for more information is posted along with all the previous annual reports at our website, isleroyalwolf.org. And um, I, I guess the, the picture shows uh, wolves that we saw for the first time when I took this photograph. Uh, I was especially interested in how they would respond to our research airplane. Fortunately, these wolves didn't seem to mind, even though so their, their parents had been caught by helicopters which uh, creates some uncertainty in their, in their minds, I'm sure. Um, some of these are pups, undoubtedly. We missed uh, the COVID year 2021, and so we, we didn't uh, have a clear idea how many, exactly how many pups were brand new in 2022 in the wintertime. But certainly some of them were. Um, and these images show some animals that are undoubtedly pups. It also mentions a quote uh, by our Michigan Attorney General, Dana Nessel. These magnificent animals serve important roles in our Great Lakes ecosystems, and they show us that dedication to family is not unique to humans. She did that while endorsing the uh, relisting of the wolf as endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. By the way, if you live in Michigan, you can vote for Dana Nessel next month as she's running for Attorney General again. Uh, wolves have had an impact already since they were restored by the National Park Service. And the, the restoration of wolves was done ultimately to save the forest of Isle Royal from moose, because moose are a, a great herbivore with tremendous capacity to e even destroy their own habitat through foraging. So wolves uh, have an effect on moose populations primarily by uh, killing the very young and the very old. Uh, so the, the targets, the main target for wolf, hunting wolves are calf, moose calves, such as this uh, young one, I think a, a photo by Sarah Hoy. Um, so cow moose are extremely protective of their calves and uh, with radio collared moose, now we can better understand that probably nothing else matters to a cow moose uh, with a calf as much as the survival of that calf. And 
the cow will give up foraging opportunities uh, uh, just to be in a more secure place. So uh, wolves in the last year, uh, 2021 cohort of calves, very few calves survived. So wolves uh, took, took out quite a few of them. And then wolves also have an effect on the old end of the age spectrum, eight to 10 years and older. <clears throat> and uh, if you look up at the, uh, the decline in the green line, the decline in the last three years, of moose from over 2,000 to just 1,350 or so this year. Um, that was especially steep this past year. And moose were dying at a rate that we hadn't seen for 25 years, actually. Uh, and they died from both wolf predation and outright starvation, malnutrition in late winter. And wolves uh, took about half of them. Um, but malnutrition still is a very important source of mortality. And the malnutrition is, is uh, complicated by the presence of winter ticks on these animals. And this is a unique tick, uh, doesn't like people, but it climbs onto moose in October. And moose don't groom themselves the way white-tailed deer do. And they certainly don't groom each other, which deer also do. So the, the ticks accumulate on moose to the point where there may be several thousand ticks on a moose in January. And then they start itching and they scratch their hair off. They bite their hair off. They suffer from anemia because of all these, uh, all these blood sucking parasites. Uh, so the, the left image there shows the skin surface of the moose on the right who was captured uh, and radio collared in February of this year. And he didn't even survive two months. He died on, I believe, April 14th this spring uh, of apparent malnutrition, but loaded with ticks. And that was true of most of the, uh, most of the animals that died this spring and uh, noticeable loads of ticks. Enough so we, we stayed away from them actually. <laughs> um, and a lot of the troubles for moose this, this past winter were probably caused by the extreme drought and warm temperatures of the summer of 2021. Uh, Sarah's conducted an analysis of long-term tick data that shows that ticks are more prevalent uh, after a warm summer. So they're very responsive to, to warm summers. And then the uh, moose are uh, disadvantaged by warm summers because they're, they're very heat sensitive and they simply don't forage when it's, uh, when it's hot. And hot means about anything over 70 degrees. Um, Plus the plants themselves were, were affected by drought. Uh, 2021 was the only year in living memory of anybody when there were no blueberries on Isle Royal. So that may have indicated a, a nutritional gap in the, in the very forage that moose were eating. So moose have taken quite a hit in the last year. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we see another 20 to 30% drop next winter. Now, back to the uh, 2018 actions. Um, once the record of decision was signed, the Park Service got very busy and Mark Romanski from the park staff in Houghton here on the Isle Royale National Park staff enlisted help from all sides of the lake and, and virtually everybody wanted to help. Uh, so federal and state agencies, tribal agents, tribal uh, communities, uh, Grand Portage, uh, Chippewa Band started off by essentially donating four wolves from Northeastern Minnesota in that first year, 2018. And then the next year, uh, first nine months of 2019, brought lots of wolves, um, most of them from Ontario and the bulk of them from Mitchcoton Island. And that's a story in and of itself, very interesting. But, uh, quite a, a load of wolves, very large wolves, I might add, from Michigan, wolves that had, had uh, were born to parents that were very, very well nourished on caribou, and they were big when they were born also. Uh, but the caribou uh, were gone. Wolves essentially got them all. And so they were uh, in a starving situation. And it was sort of an animal rescue operation to put them from Michigan onto Isle Royale. But I think everybody wanted to see it happen. 
a couple of wolves from Ontario, 11F as uh, a female from Michipicoten. Um, and uh, she paired up with uh, a black male from mainland Ontario. And black wolves are very interesting genetically and in terms of an immune response. And there was just a paper published this week in Science by uh, uh, collaborators at Yellowstone National Park about the significance of black, the gene that, that coats for black, black coat, codes for black coats in, in wolves. Anyway, 11F uh, at some risk to herself went into the middle of the island and picked up 16M as her, uh, as her chosen mate in 2021. And I had great hopes because black offspring would be uh, a very interesting twist to the future of the population. But it was not to be. Uh, 11F was uh, killed spring of 2021. And there was another wolf skull found not too far away. Uh, we don't know if it's 16M, but eventually we should be able to find out. But 16M is apparently not around anymore. And with him, uh, the hope of black wolves in the future disappeared. Uh, in 2020, uh, virtually all the wolves on the island were radio collared, so this this may never happen again. But it was a unique opportunity to see the see the details of animal movement, and uh, it shows the uh, the two primary packs, west and east, that developed, um, and those are the main territorial holders, and everybody else is is outside uh, outside of territorial system. Uh, 11F and 16M are the green lines. And you see they sort of danced around the periphery of the island. And they spent a lot of time on islands at the west end, uh, even in the middle of the winter with no, with no ice connecting those islands. 11F would uh, apparently lead that male out into white caps <laughs> in the middle of January and swim a half a mile to get to that island because she's safe. And uh, but ultimately she was killed on the main island. And then the purple line was the, uh, the matriarch from Mitch Bacotin who came in in very poor shape, but she it turned out she was pregnant and uh, had two pups, which she seemed to have raised herself uh, in 2019. Um, but these, these the lower panels show what happens, show the, the kind of life led by these peripheral groups, pairs usually that form and may not have a very long-term future. And indeed, both of those peripheral groups, I, th I think, are gone. Um, and I should go back to the top graph, 12M and 15F uh, adopted a territory exactly corresponding to the original population's East PAC. Uh, and the last two wolves uh, occupied that same red area and it wasn't until uh, the death of the male and probably the female also from the original population that within weeks, these new wolves were, were uh, infiltrating and finally established in the old footprint of the original, uh, original population, which was kind of surprising. Um, so that's my update. Uh, and you can certainly ask me many more questions and I know you will. But I want to spend some time on uh, this issue of ecosystem effects uh, of wolves, indirect ecosystem effects, which uh, is a major focus of wolf restoration advocacy. And um, I want to spend time on, instead of the terrestrial system, which has gathered so much attention, particularly from Yellowstone, look at the, uh, the aquatic systems, because moose are uh, giant animal that feeds a lot underwater. Uh, that's a wart, by the way, on his shoulder. It's a very little consequence, but uh, this bull was spending quite a bit of time underwater feeding on plants that we can't identify because we can't see them. Uh, he's also radio collared and that radio collar allowed us to follow his fate. Uh, about two months after I shot this uh, video, he was killed in a rutting fight after he was gored by another bull who poked him in the stomach and he died of peritonitis. But it, uh, it highlights what moose do in aquatic systems. 
and how they might have a tremendous uh, ecological impact. Now, finally, to see what they do underwater has been quite a task. Uh, so what I'm showing you now is footage that we shot in 2004, a long time ago. Uh, and it's the only footage that exists of moose underwater. Um, and many film companies are trying to uh, duplicate it with high quality equipment, but so far it hasn't happened. But we got lucky, very lucky. And uh, there's a couple noteworthy things about this moose. Uh, there are no bubbles coming out of his nose because moose have very fancy noses with valves and uh, muscle attachments, which allow them to close their nostrils off whenever they want to. They just have to think about it. I want to close my nostrils and they can do it. Uh, we can't do that. <laughs> we have to hold our nose, but uh, moose can do that. And also uh, his eyes are open um, all the time. It doesn't seem to be at all selective. Um, and it, it seems to be that moose will eat just about anything under the water. But these underwater plants are very high in protein. They may be as high as 30% raw protein. So it's a rich source of forage and nutrition. It's relatively safe from wolves. And it's also a thermal refuge for moose who often get too, way too hot in the summertime. This is what I mean by we were lucky. I mean, he could have just taken out that $20,000 borrowed camera, but he didn't. <laughs> So now to, uh, oops, to the story, uh, the story of one lake, uh, Ojibwe Lake, um, which is shown in the top photo in May of 2009 from Google Earth images, open water. But by August, it's virtually clogged with a plant uh, called water shield, which is a native rooted aquatic plant which has floating leaves. And it exists uh, in water as deep as about two meters. So the center part of the lake is just too deep. It, uh, it can't be colonized by this plant. So the, uh, and that inset shows how dense the plant can be. It can cover the entire surface of the water, shade out all the other plants. And it's really quite amazing. This is what the, the lake looked like. Now to a moose and, a, and to beaver, that is just a huge salad bowl. And virtually every part of a, of a water shield plant is edible. The, the leaves, the roots, the stems, and it's, all, and it's very high protein. So both beaver and moose uh, gravitate to eating water shield whenever they can. I uh, didn't even know what the plant was when it showed up in about 2007, uh, but the moose quickly learned what it was and how great it was to eat. So they, every year there were more and more moose showing up to eat this luscious uh, salad. We saw as many as 15 moose at a time, identified up to 30 individuals um, in one day. This is Eric Freeman, one of our Moose Watch volunteers. We spent some time watching moose there. Um, fortunately, uh, a PhD student of Joseph Bump's uh, named Brenda Bergman was just initiating a study of aquatic impacts of moose. And she erected several of these exclosures. One of them happened to be in Lake Ojibwe. And she was the one that told me what this plant was, <laughs> where it could be found. And um, fortunately had her work really enhanced what we were able to learn from what happened at Lake Ojibwe. So these exclosures are, I don't know, 15 feet or so across and they're fenced down the middle to exclude both moose and beaver from the top part and just moose uh, from the lower part. So obviously uh, uh, both moose and beaver have effects on this plant, but Brenda found that moose consume about 10 times what beaver uh, consumes. So moose can really outcompete beaver pretty handily. Uh, by 2010 or so, Moose had utterly trashed the lake. I mean, it, in uh, parts of the, the shoreline uh, looked like a, just a, a mess. I mean, this was your pond and you were doing this to a pond, you'd probably be arrested. And much of the lake looked like kind of an open sewer. I didn't know where this was going. Uh, 
And it turns out nobody did, and nobody could have ever predicted what was going to happen next. But in 2017, in November, um, the main dam that holds back Lake Ojibwe broke. I should point out that Lake Ojibwe has an old and ancient history, uh, goes back 10,000 years, and there's a very rich pollen core from this lake that shows that water shield has been around Lake Ojibwe since about 8,000 years ago. But this is just a, a rain catchment basin with no real outlet. So for about 8,000 years, the lake has been accumulating organic matter in, a, in the bottom uh, to the point where it's about five meters of ooze in the bottom of that lake. And that's, that becomes important, helps you understand what happened next. Um, I think the sequence of events was uh, that moose outcompeted beaver. Beaver could no longer feed through the winter on aquatic plants, so they had to go ashore and start cutting trees. And that puts them in mortal danger from wolves. And so wolves began to clean up on uh, these beaver. There were three different colonies in the lake, and some of the beaver just up and left. Most of the beavers seemed to have gotten eaten by wolves. Um, and I happened to have a remote camera there that caught the, the one of the two wolves left on Isle Royal, the, the uh, male. And as he starts moving here, you uh, can notice his stomach, which is highly distended, undoubtedly full of beaver. He's actually carrying a kit beaver in his mouth that he didn't have room to swallow. And he's still marking, even though there's only two wolves left on the island. <laughs> still very important to mark your territory. The female came by four minutes later, uh, again with a full stomach. So wolves killed the beavers. Uh, and then the, the dam broke and nobody, no beavers replaced it. And so the next spring, it was just a mud flat. Uh, Lake, Lake Ojibwe essentially is gone. It will not recover. It will not return to anything we've ever seen before uh, by any means that I can imagine. So uh, what happens next? Uh, well, the vegetation carried on and uh, uh, revegetated the, the mud flats. And now three, four years later, there are birch trees starting to grow, uh, which may set this whole area onto a, a different trajectory, but it won't be Lake Ojibwe. <laughs> and that highlights something that that's worth thinking about. Just because you restore wolves, for example, everything doesn't just return to the way it used to be 100 years ago. And for moose, it was actually a kind of a disaster. That five meters of organic ooze in the bottom of Lake Ojibwe was a death trap for uh, eight moose that we know of in the last uh, four years that have gotten into mud that they couldn't extricate themselves from. Uh, and it's mostly calves or yearlings and old moose that get caught, the weaker members of the population. And this moose incidentally had broken both of his mandibles uh, completely off. And so he couldn't even feed. So people on social media said, can't you do something? And of course we knew at the time, no. And we knew eventually absolutely nothing could have saved that moose. So Tom Hobbs at uh, Colorado State University, who's uh, one of the cautionary voices out there that's, that says, uh, you know, Yellowstone hasn't been completely remade. In fact, it, it can't be completely remade the way it was prior to the elimination of wolves. But predators are so important, their removal has such long lasting effects that it's naive to think you can quickly reverse the effects of their absence by restoration. And then maybe more generally, uh, he, he said in a later piece, maintaining an intact ecosystem is so much easier than trying to restore it once the pieces have been lost. So with that, I'll end, but uh, certainly restoration is an important goal, nevertheless, uh, but it's, uh, it's not a, a panacea for everything that might be needed in any ecosystem that's predator free. Well, thank you so much, Rolf. We've already received a ton of questions, um, and I want to apologize in advance that we're probably not to, going to be able to get to everything, but we'll do our best. Um, sure. We've received several, Rolf, about 
um, whether there are future plans to introduce um, new wolves to Isle Royale. Yeah, uh, fortunately, Mark Romansky from the Park Service gave a talk a couple of weeks ago in the Twin Cities at a wolf symposium, and he, he had to address that question. Uh, wait and see, I think, is basically what he said. Uh, there are certainly some genetic red flags out there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think the full genetic picture will, will have to be assembled before any decisions about further manipulation might be made. Uh, obviously, it's really hard to just insert another breeder because uh, wolves are very territorial and they'll most likely just be killed. So uh, there's a limit to what, what can be adjusted at this point. We did get a question about that, um, the process of introducing um, new animals and whether they are ever kind of integrated into the larger pack or if they always form these smaller groups that you were talking about. Oh, it, it's all dependent on the context. Uh, you can, uh, the immigrants that came in in 1997 walked into a, an ideal situation. All three packs had lost an alpha male. So he just waltzed into one of them and took over, uh, fortunately for him. More commonly, they're just killed uh, because the territorial packs aren't interested in, in help from the mainland, <laughs> basically. Uh, so it just depends, and it's very hard to generalize what exactly is going to happen, even when you know which wolf is coming and which pack is involved. Uh, wolves are individuals, and they behave as individuals. Well, what is the approximate number of wolves currently on the island? Mm, yes. Uh, this past winter, we, we estimated about 28. Um, and they're definitely on an upswing. Uh, and so I, I would expect considerably over 30 next winter. And so wolves are going up pretty quickly and moose are going the other direction pretty quickly. And did you mention, did you, do you know if there were pups this spring? Uh, yes, uh, both of the territorial packs had, um, I assume, a respectable litters of pups. And uh, Mark Romansky mentioned a third litter, uh, sort of a peripheral litter, which is significant because it was a, a female born to the, to the sibling pair. So her parents were siblings, but she uh, outbred apparently with a Michigan male. So uh, her pups, if they survive, would be genetically very interesting individuals. So, but, but it, you know, I, don't, I don't know if they have survived or will survive, but in any case, two good, two good litters, one in each of the territorial packs would be expected. Rolf, are wolves the kind of only apex predator on Isle Roll or are there other um, animals controlling the moose population? Well, there are other animals controlling them, but they're small. They're ticks, uh, <laughs> mainly the ticks, I guess. Uh, but they're the primary apex predator for sure. The only large mammal uh, that is capable of preying on moose. And they also prey on beaver significantly in the summertime. Uh, but uh, beaver are essentially locked in their safe houses uh, in the wintertime. So all through winter, it's only moose. And even in the summertime, uh, so a lot of moose in the diet that comes from calves and, and yearlings. When a mother moose has another calf, she'll kick her previous offspring out of the house more or less. So those are animals that are wandering around as yearlings without much experience. And uh, they're sort of lost and forlorn without their mother and easy prey for wolves. You mentioned early on, Rolf, about um, the possibility of wolves being relisted as endangered species. Could you talk a little bit about that and um, your opinion on whether that's an important step? Um, the wolf was put back on the endangered species list, species list in February, I believe, after uh, another court uh, decision was made. I think that's, I think that's the fifth time that the proposals of the Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the wolf were uh, kicked back by the courts. Um, so it means um, 
yeah, they're federally protected uh, every, every place in the East, except Minnesota where they're listed as threatened. It probably would be a step in the right direction if the, instead of trying to go whole hog to delist the wolf for fish and wildlife service, we'll just reclassify them as threatened uh, just in Minnesota and I mean, in Wisconsin and Michigan, just the way they are in Minnesota. And that would allow uh, depredating wolves to be killed by federal agents essentially in Minnesota. Um, right now in Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, nobody can kill a wolf legally. And so depredation is, has to be managed other ways and there are non-lethal ways of managing predation. And these are being uh, tried as, as much as landowners want to try them. But where's the future going? Uh, well, <laughs> depends on subsequent proposals by the Fish and Wildlife Service and success in defending those proposals in the legal system. We've received a few questions, Rolf, about um, how climate change is impacting Iowa right now. And I know you mentioned the um, reduction in um, ice bridges to the island is one possible impact of the climate changing. Are there other examples? Yeah, the lack of ice bridges is a, is a principal one uh, because it affects wolves and then everything that, that wolves affect. Uh, but probably moose are more vulnerable to climate change because at Iowa Royal, moose are at the southern limit of their, their North American range and they're really limited by heat. Um, they begin to respond to temperature. The only response they can have to temperature is to breathe faster. They don't perspire. So if they get too warm, they start breathing faster and trying to evaporate moisture from their, essentially their trachea and their mouth and, um, and nasal cavities. And that's not a very effective way to get rid of heat. Um, so they begin breathing faster at about 38, 40 degrees. And then the rate of respiration just goes up as it gets hotter and hotter. Eventually 70 degrees or so, they've got to be in water or in moist areas in the shade. Um, so they're very challenged by heat directly. And then there's a second, uh, a double whammy from heat because uh, as winters have become shorter and milder, white-tailed deer have extended their range north and white-tailed deer carry a, a very nasty parasite, nasty for moose, uh, brain worm. And uh, one brain worm, which most deer have, one brain worm will kill a moose. So uh, deer have now taken over the most, much of the western, northwestern shore of Lake Superior. So the, the immediate adjacent mainland is loaded with deer and not as many moose as there used to be. Um, so climate is a challenge for, for moose especially. We've got an, a, a couple comments about the Moose Watch program. Could you talk a little bit about that, Rolf? Yes. Um, in 1988, we began to recruit um, citizen scientists, essentially people that like to backpack and have some experience backpacking that think they would like to backpack cross country off trail in order to find uh, dead moose and moose carcasses, moose skeletons, moose bones. And initially we thought, gosh, nobody's gonna pay hundreds of dollars to do that, but it turns out it's quite an adventure. And so we now rely very heavily on volunteers, uh, we call it Moose Watch now, um, who come for a week of uh, very heavy duty cross country backpacking uh, led by an experienced individual who knows where they are and what they do when they find moose bones and that sort of thing. Um, so, um, and those people bring in uh, a, a large portion of the data that we get each year from, from the moose population. Um, and we'll, we'll uh, send out dates for the 2023 schedule next month. And um, we look forward to seeing new faces and old faces every year. We got a question about the tick situation that you mentioned in the slides. Um, it, 
was that just a kind of particularly bad winter or has it gotten worse? Um, and are there any efforts to control the situation of tick with ticks? I think this past winter was a, a, a above the average uh, tick year uh, with last summer's heat contributing to it. Um, can anything be done? Uh, no one anywhere in North America has figured out how to control ticks. Uh, the state of Maine is uh, where there's heavy losses of uh, especially moose calves to ticks. The uh, state of Maine is trying a very big gamble by shooting down the moose population uh, with the theory that uh, tick, tick infestation is density dependent. If you if you reduce moose density, the ticks will be reduced, and then moose could be, in theory, brought back. Uh, they've got five years to, to test that concept, and I think they're in year two or so right now. That's definitely an experiment worth watching, but I'm glad I'm not in charge of it. <laughs> Ruff, could you talk a little bit about um, kind of all the time you spent on Isle Royale, particularly the early days when you um, were first starting to go to Isle Royale to research the wolf population? Wow, um, sure, I, it's a long time ago. Uh, I came in as the fourth you know, graduate student or postdoctoral associate um, working under Durwood Allen at Purdue University. Uh, the program was already 12 years old and it was uh, somewhat uncertain what in the world I was going to do after the system had already been studied pretty hard for 12 years. And uh, so uh, there was that uncertainty, but it didn't particularly bother me a lot because I dearly wanted to do it. So, uh, and eventually, I guess what uh, happened was uh, all hell broke loose with the wolves. I mean, they increased and increased every year for the next decade. And what seemed like a stable wolf moose system of roughly 600 or so moose and two dozen wolves just got completely thrown out the window and wolves increased to the highest density they'd ever seen anywhere. And moose declined. Uh, so the, the table was sort of set, we'll figure this out. So that's what I spent my time trying to do. We have a question about, um, do you have any kind of memorable um, close encounters with wolves when you were on the island? Oh, let's see. I um, There was one interesting uh, situation where there was a wolf that happened to be wearing a radio collar. And uh, we had two little, two little boys, our kids. And they were, I don't know, five years old and eight years old. And um, I was off doing something. And my wife, Candy, wanted to go check on the whereabouts of this wolf. And she went up a couple of miles up on the ridge to listen uh, through with the receiver and headphones for the signal of this wolf. And she heard the signal right back where she'd come from. So she went back down the trail and uh, as she got closer and closer to the dock where she'd taken off, the signal kept getting louder and louder and louder. And finally she realized that wolf is sitting right there where our kids are. <laughs> and they were playing on the beach and we had never thought about wolves as being a danger, even to little kids. Uh, it turns out the wolf was uh, resting about a hundred yards away from where our kids were <clears throat> at our research camp. And the wolf was spending every night going down to the shore of Lake Superior and diving for uh, remains of a moose that had uh, died in the lake. And so he was essentially diving for moose parts, which he'd haul out of the water and then feed on and then go back in the woods and rest during the daytime. Um, I don't think we'd leave our kids on the lake shore anymore, <laughs> even though the risk of, of wolves uh, is extremely low, but little kids, uh, no, I wouldn't bet on <laughs> them being completely safe. Okay. Um, okay, we have some uh, questions about 
wolf behavior, um, how the wolf packs are hunting the moose, um, and also kind of their, their breeding behavior, whether it's normal for siblings to breed normally. Oh, uh, uh, for the current wolves, uh, yeah, they are certainly killing moose. They, they had no trouble um, doing what we expected wolves to do. Uh, it's interesting that many of the moose killed in the first couple of years were not just the calves and old moose. They killed quite a few young adults, two, three, four, five-year-olds. And I'm not sure yet why that is the case. It could be that these moose were born and raised during a, uh, a period when there weren't really wolves to worry about and they didn't learn uh, how to be careful. In other words, they didn't listen to their mothers. And it could be that they're somehow vulnerable because they were born at very high dense, very high population density. And uh, the nutrition level at the time of birth has a lot to do with the future survival uh, and health of, of that moose. So uh, that is certainly a, a, an aspect of wolf predation that we'll be watching closely. Because if wolves begin to kill young adults to an extent that they didn't used to, it could, uh, it could greatly increase the overall predation effect. Uh, in terms of breeding, um, no, siblings don't usually breed. Uh, and uh, you wonder, well, why did it happen? And I can only guess, but at the time when uh, 15 F of the female was, uh, I mean, she was established with her brother in this territory and uh, she would have probably preferred to mate with someone that's not her brother. Uh, but the only other males out there were a couple of males from mainland Michigan, uh, if I've got this right, a couple un unattached males anyway. Um, and those unattached males from Michigan weighed maybe 20 pounds less than she did. <laughs> so I think she was brought up thinking of potential mates as big, big boys like her father and her brothers. And these little, little, little guys from Michigan didn't quite measure up to her standard. I don't know. Um, she seems to have only bred one year and then I, we couldn't document that she was even present last year. So it was a one shot phenomenon, but it, uh, it will certainly complicate the genetic picture uh, in the near future. And then even now, both of the alpha males in both the territorial packs, they're brothers from Mitch Picotin. So there's a heavy representation of Mitch Picotin genes. And uh, we don't know what the long-term impacts of that will be. But it's, it's certainly um, going to be documented as carefully as possible. Primarily by Dr. Kristen Bresky, a geneticist, and primarily with scats that people in the field like us pick up. <laughs> so very high priority on collecting good, fresh wolf scats at any time of the year. We've had a few questions about whether um, the fires on Isle Royal have had an impact on wolf and moose populations. Yeah, there was a, a wildfire in 2021 and a smaller, uh, probably a camper started fire in 2022. Um, I think the total acreage burned in 2021 was uh, less than 400 acres. It burned a significant piece of Blake Point but uh, it's, it's from the standpoint of wolves and moose, it's, it's a postage stamp. Um, and uh, so I don't expect it'll have any tremendous effect. Now, year by year, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a little fire here and there's a little fire there. So every four or five years, there's another little fire and they do eventually add up to perhaps something that's significant. But, uh, nothing that uh, we would anticipate would materially affect wolves and moose. I've also had gotten some questions about um, what you talked about with uh, Lake Ojibwe and whether that was sort of an isolated incident or whether other lakes are disappearing on the island, um, as well as how long you think it's going to take before those mudflats eventually become um, forested. 
Uh, it's very much a, a case unto itself. Uh, there, Bre Brenda Bergman surveyed all the lakes. Uh, and the ones she couldn't get to, I, I looked at from the air. And there were, there were five ponds, <clears throat> all beaver ponds, that were taken over by watershed. And they all followed a similar trajectory uh, of moose exhaustion, uh, moose exhausting the, the watershed forage. Um, none of the other ponds disappeared though, as a result. So Lake Ojibwe is very unique unto itself. It's the only lake of that size without an outlet. It essentially was just a rain barrel that collected uh, organic matter for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so, I mean, it was sad to see, but um, vegetation will not be denied. I mean, the uh, plants took over the mud flats right away. And then these birch seedlings, which I first noticed this year, they're pretty abundant. Um, and I don't know where that's going. Of course, beavers eat birch, but um, I think we're a long, long way from beavers being able to figure out how to recolonize Lake Ojibwe. But uh, it's going to go on its own path, and it's a bit unpredictable. Uh, of course, moose eat birch also. So um, one moose could come in there and essentially eat all the birch reproduction in half a day. Um, so the trajectory of Lake Ojibwe may depend heavily on where the moose population is going. So a, a critical question, obviously, is how low are moose going to go and will wolves uh, push them down to levels we haven't seen before or maybe hold them there for longer than we've seen before? Uh, that will have huge repercussions for the forest across Iowa and all the, all the lakes too and beaver populations and virtually anything uh, that I could figure out out there would be affected. We have about uh, seven minutes less left, so please do submit any uh, more questions you have and we'll do our best to get to those. Um, Rolf, we had a question about um, the photography in the book as well as um, some of the videography in the slide presentation. Do, do you take those um, images and videos yourself? Yeah, all the images in the book I took, yeah. Um, uh, the videos, uh, yeah, the, the, the most forging underwater that was just shot from a, my canoe. Um, the uh, underwater one uh, required uh, some, a couple other <laughs> people, one of whom was a, a relative youngster with quick hands that could run the joystick of that little yellow submarine that we were navigating on the bottom of the lake. So we borrowed that little yellow submarine from an educational program at Michigan Tech. And, um, uh, the reason, I, I don't know why nobody's been able to duplicate it. Uh, it this was a corded um, under remotely operated vehicle. In other words, there's a cord running from the machine and under the water to the boat. That I would never do again, especially not with moose because they got long legs and antlers. I mean, I could imagine getting things tangled up. So. It, to, to do it right now would mean a, a truly remotely operated underwater vehicle, which I'm sure exists. But uh, it also requires just the right aquatic habitat. And the place where we were filming had just enough current to sweep away the, the silt that moose were generating with, with every bite. So that is a hard uh, place to duplicate, actually. And in the slide presentation, you also mentioned some filming happening from the air. Um, is that something you still do? Yeah, a lot of a lot of photographs are taken from the research aircraft, or fixed, small fixed wing aircraft, which is our primary observation vehicle. So there's it's just a small fixed wing plane with room for one pilot and one observer. Uh, so the the uh, photography is important because we can we can see things better in photographs than we can see with our eyeballs. So if you see something, um, you can take pictures now with big lenses and fancy digital cameras and blow things up to the point where you can hardly believe it. But you can see details that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So I tried all kinds of binoculars and monoculars and gyro stabilized binoculars and um, 
Today's cameras make it exceptionally easy and much better. This is a kind of big one, um, but what do you think are some of the kind of big takeaways or lessons um, that we should be learning from the study you've been doing of the wolf and moose populations on Isle Royal? Uh, it's a big one, but it's an easy one. Um, mm -hmm. We've been impressed as time has gone on that the driving features of the wolf moose system are unplanned, unimagined events that happened. For example, the arrival of canine parvovirus in 1981, which decimated the wolf population. The arrival of, a, of an immigrant, 1997, that renewed the genetic vigor of the population. Both of these things came from the mainland. We didn't see them coming. We couldn't even imagine them coming. Um, and um, so that characteristic that, that uh, um, what happens in the future is contingent on a bunch of not necessarily random events, but unpredictable events. Uh, that seems to pervade uh, all, all populations, all ecosystems in all space and all time. You know, you think of the, the arrival of an asteroid 65 million years ago, which wiped out dinosaurs and provided an, an opening for mammals. Um, whenever a hurricane hits a city, there's a huge amount of chance which direction it's going. Uh, in our individual lives, uh, some family member is killed by a car. It has devastating effects. All of these things are, are life-changing, trajectory-changing, unpredictable, unplanned. And yet those are the features that really um, determine where you're going. Uh, and it's easy this year because we've just come through a, a global pandemic and who would have ever guessed <laughs> four years ago that we would uh, have COVID-19 dominate lives of the entire global population. Um, so disease has always been the, uh, the example I would tend to bring up with students uh, and it's a uh, pretty easy sell right now. Well, do you have any recommendations for folks who um, want to learn more about what's happening on Isle Royal with regards to your research or how can they support your work there? Uh, yeah, I'd go to our, our website, isleroyalwolf.org, and you can find uh, all the annual reports there, the special features. You can also go to our Facebook page, Wolves and Moose of Isle Royal. Uh, and we, we slowly put things out there of current interest. Um, and then if you're into heavy duty backpacking, you could consider a moose watch trip. Um, so those are all things uh, uh, worth doing. There's also a couple of brand new books, uh, one by John Bustich, uh, Restoring the Balance was published about a year ago. And then also one by Dave Meach uh, called Wolf Island about the first three years of the study, what his experiences were like in 1958 to 1962. So there's, uh, there's those resources that might be attractive for those that would like to just sit in a chair calmly and read about it. Well, that's a, a perfect segue to what unfortunately is gonna have to be our last question this evening. And Rolf, that's, what are you reading lately? Oh, um, right now, Wallace Stegner, uh, Crossing to Safety. And the one before that was The Book of Eels by the Swedish author, uh, Patrick Svensson. Um, I'm working my way through the history of the Russian Revolution by uh, Trotsky, but boy, that's a, that's a slog. But uh, every now and then, if there's nothing else, <laughs> I'll pick that up and read about a few more weeks in 1917. Well, Rolf, uh, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, any final comments? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, it's been great talking to you. I wish uh, we could have immediate audience uh, participation, but there are lots of advantages to Zooming and uh, I can go uh, talk to people all over the world uh, where I, I just couldn't possibly imagine doing it any other way. So 
I really do like this Zoom technology. So it's been great to uh, get the word out. Absolutely. Um, and everyone, Rolf's book is The Wolves of Isle Royal. I'm sorry, that's not coming through very well. Um, and it is on sale um, from the University of Michigan Press website for $15 with free shipping through the end of October. We will include information on how you can get that deal, um, both in the Zoom chat as well as on Facebook. Rolf, thank you again, and thank you everyone for participating this evening. Thank you, Scott. Have a great evening.